2022 was the year land wars returned to Europe as Russia mounted a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. It was as sudden as it was brutal and relentless. Ukrainians woke up to find themselves plunged into the midst of all explosions and air raid sirens ringing out here in Kyiv and cities across this country as Russia launched a full-scale invasion on multiple fronts in the early hours of this morning. Hundreds and hundreds of people here in Dnipro who have come to the center of town and they are in the process here in this section of making Molotov cocktails. This is Yablonska Street in Bucha, and it shows the vehicles, Ukrainian vehicles, having to drive around, to slalom around bodies in the road. We've pixeled them, pixeled them out um, so that they're not so horrible, but there's this, this vehicle recording bodies having to drive around them. The Russians have said this is simply not true. Uh, these bodies have appeared since they left the area on the 30th, 31st of March. And they said these bodies were just placed there, um, obviously by the Ukrainians in order to discredit the Russians. And so this piece of film is, has been subject to an enormous amount of controversy. This week, a major breakthrough for Ukraine in the Northeast. Its forces advancing quickly through the Russian lines wrecked Russian vehicles lining the roads. Russian forces caught off guard, apparently in disarray. Ukrainian troops liberating cities and the Ukrainian flag flying once again. Whatever I think of Putin, I think he's a reactionary, um, reactionary autocrat uh, who is should be regarded as the enemy of anyone progressive. Um, is he's not been irrational in terms of his previous interventions? If you think Georgia, um, for example, like you know he essentially you know kind of localized skirmishes or Kazakhstan. You know you, you look at that and you can see the reason behind it, partly because you know. You can see that the Russians have a very good chance of winning. And what I find so shocking about Ukraine was that we don't, we're not accustomed, obviously, to major land invasions in Europe after World War II um, of that shape. Obviously, you had the Warsaw Pact invasions. My dad was caught up in one in Czechoslovakia in 1968. Um, pictures of him in Wensler Square, uh, which I always found interesting. To be fair, in, in, in Hungary in 1956, it was far bloodier, but it wasn't a, a war between states. Of, of of sort which we haven't seen in Europe for a very long time, so I found that very surprising. I think it, for me it was clarifying in that I think I would locate myself, even though I'm sure some people would describe it in the anti-imperialist tradition. In that my understanding is, if you look at global politics, we should centre the role present and historic of what we call the Western or global North nations who colonised. Uh, much of the earth, plundered their resources, subjugated them, it inflicted terrible genocides and horror, which we haven't come to terms with at all. Um, and then even after wars of liberation, struggles for independence, those countries are still subjugated because of the global frameworks that are set in place. And occasionally, you know, through things like the West supporting dictatorships or direct armed interventions. What the Russia's invasion of Ukraine should be a clarifying moment that, although that is a very important way of looking at the world, Russia did engage in an outright war of aggression against Ukraine for which there is no justification. And if people talk about NATO's expansion east, and I'm, well, I wouldn't support, I'd vote to leave NATO, but that puts me in a small minority. I think we have to understand where Eastern European leftists and progressives come from, because their perspective is it's reasonable for you to talk about the West and Iraq, but our historic oppression has come from the East. It has come from Russia, and we have reasons to fear Russia, and that's pushed large sections of Eastern Europe voluntarily into the arms of NATO. It's not like they've been coerced 
into that position. And I don't and I think you can look at Putin, who was supported in his rise by Blair and was a friend of the West to begin with. Let's not forget, including when he flattened Chechnya, which was a horrific crime. Chechnya was completely flattened with per capita far greater losses than Ukraine has suffered. Um, and that was supported by the West at the time. But I think it's so important to just be clear. You don't have to support Zelensky or the Ukrainian government or whatever. He was democratically elected. He got like 70% of the vote. I don't think anyone would dispute that. And he was elected, frankly, not as some big rabble-rousing Ukrainian, let's take on Russia. He actually stood on a platform of reconciliation with Russia. And I don't think he actually did anything on, on you know, well, he didn't. Nothing was done. Sorry, very clear. Nothing was done. Uh, to provoke Russia in any meaningful way whatsoever. So I think it's clarifying in whatever we think, and we should, about the role of imperialism from the West, this was a brutal uh, war of aggression, and we should support Ukraine's war effort as a war of liberation. You know, if Ukraine stopped fighting, people say this a lot, but it's true. If Russia stopped fighting, that would be, they would well, just go home. If Ukraine stopped fighting, they would literally be, destroyed as an independent nation. They would be subjugated by Russia, which would inflict vast horrors, which we've seen in their occupied areas, which you've seen validated by independent human rights organizations. So I think we have to be clear here, there is an aggressor and there is a war of liberation and we should support that war of liberation. And that is not in any way compromising our stance against the horrors of Western imperialism, which define much of the world um, and which we should continue to fight unapologetically. Yeah, I don't think we need to say there's, there were no provocations. I mean, I suppose in, in 2014, you had lots of people who saw that as a coup. Then you did have you know, violence in the East from neo-Nazis towards sort of more pro-Russian um, members of the Ukrainian populace. And then Zelensky, I think, sort of arrested some pro-Russian politicians. But obviously, none of that justifies an invasion a full-scale invasion. I suppose that's why I think in the run-up to that war, I at least thought one needed to come to this with a lot more nuance because there is sort of different legitimate interests in the region and there are ways in which sort of pro-Russian Ukrainians or the Russians themselves would have felt like they've been a bit screwed over by the West in that region. But once you have a full-scale invasion where you've just got the Russians bombing Ukrainian cities and Ukrainian civilians, the grey areas go essentially, don't they? Where grey areas remain is what's going to happen next. So as you can see here in the yellow zones, that's places which Russia had controlled, which have now been won back by Ukraine. So the fight back from the Ukrainians surprised many people, myself included. And I have to say, you know, most sort of national security experts, even Western intelligence before the war thought that Ukraine would fall very quickly. They've surprised essentially everyone. You can see just around Melitopol in the southeast. The reason that's in yellow with black stripes is because apparently there's sort of partisan resistance there. So that's why that's being called contested. This is a map from the Financial Times. One of the reasons why it's such a scary situation, really, is because, as you've said, you know, we want Ukraine to win this war, essentially. They've been invaded in a sort of imperialist war of aggression, right? But at the same time, you have a situation where every time the Ukrainians do very well, that raises the prospect of Vladimir Putin escalating. Now, I think especially if Ukraine were to try and take back Crimea, which is something that, you know, the, the most ardent supporters of Ukraine and NATO and, um, and understandably many people in Ukraine want, uh, that's when I think you could be looking at something like nuclear war. Mm -hmm.